Hi everyone, this is uh, Nicolas Chelan. I'm the Chief Software Officer for the Air Force. I'm also the co-lead of the DoD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative. And uh, welcome to today's presentation on the DoD Enterprise DevSecOps Initiative and Platform One. We really streamline access to DevSecOps. We would not have been able to uh, scale and succeed without solving some of the acquisition uh, impediments. And so we created the DevSecOps basic ordering agreements, the BOAS contract vehicles that have uh, cloud services, um, talent, and licenses. Uh, and that streamline access to all three. Uh, so a program like S35 can uh, reach out to platform one and either use the contract decentralized, uh, training their contracting officer to use it directly or use our contracting officers. Uh, I think the decentralized option is gonna bring broader scale. So we try to train uh, the contracting officers in using the BOAS directly. Uh, but in effect, you can place you know, an order usually within 30 days, sometimes 60 days to get cloud services, licenses, and talent. Uh, awarded very quickly. Um, so teams that need cloud compute storage, maybe they need uh, uh, DevSecOps engineers, reliability engineers, developers, uh, Scrum masters, maybe they need uh, 20 different type of licenses, they can get all that done uh, with those contracts vehicle, uh, usually uh, uh, within 30 days. So when you look at the, the architecture and you look at uh, uh, the complexity of, uh, of a DevSecOps uh, stack. Uh, imagine if you were running all these as virtual machines and you had to update them and patch them and you have a dev test staging environment and you have uh, different classification levels, very quickly you would be overwhelmed and it's not gonna scale. Uh, so that's why we picked containers and that's why we uh, centrally accredited and hardened these containers so they can be reused across DoD. Um, that really streamlines access to these uh, uh, commercial or open source tools. Um, and it's also much easier for companies to get their uh, software accredited to be used across classification levels. And so uh, Iron Bank can ingest containers from uh, anywhere, uh, from open source uh, projects and commercial uh, companies, startups or larger companies, does not matter. We have about I would say 80 plus companies now uh, pushing containers to the Iron Bank. So uh, why did we uh, uh, pick uh, Kubernetes and containers? Well, first of all, uh, wanted to avoid vendor locking like we talked about. So we picked uh, the Open Container Initiative OCI containers. Uh, uh, so containers are agnostic Lego blocks. Uh, agnostic to the runtime and to the build. And then uh, we picked a CNCF uh, uh, Kubernetes compliant cluster so we can have different options uh, supported by different companies and cloud providers. But at the same time, uh, we are not getting locked in to orchestration uh, solutions or networking or storage APIs uh, by using that abstraction layer. And uh, if you compare you know, SaaS uh, versus uh, uh, containers, Obviously, SaaS wouldn't require FedRAMP, and even if you do FedRAMP high, you can only maybe get to L5 if you do all the additional controls. If you do FedRAMP moderate, you end up L2, which is really not enough for DoD, and it does not get you access to the classified side. And with containers on the other side, we will run them in, on uh, our environments. So you give us uh, the containers and we run them on a uh, 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 government enclave and uh, we can accredit that all the way to, to SAP if need be. And so that's really uh, giving us flexibility. And so if you wanna get your, your containers onboarded on Iron Bank, whether, whether you're a DoD program uh, trying to share uh, a capability to the rest of DoD or your uh, a company, uh, you can go to that link to get all the information you need uh, to be onboarded. And please read the documentation before reaching out to us. Uh, we get a lot of questions that are inside uh, and answered inside the documentation. So please uh, re read the freaking manual uh, first uh, and then reach out to us if you have questions. Uh, containers are immutable. So that gives us this concept of a kind of a gold disk concept, but that can actually scale and works across uh, environment. You can run the same container uh, on embedded systems at the edge, on, on classified cloud, on premise, on, on public clouds, wherever. Um, and that really um, 
enables reuse. Uh, of course, Kubernetes as an orchestration stack brings resiliency, self-healing of the containers. So if they crash, they, they self-heal and restore. Um, we automatically inject the SciCal container security stack, uh, which brings a zero trust and behavior detection and continuous monitoring stack. So we have this baked in grant guaranteed security, regardless if a developer uh, of a container forgets about it. We don't care because it's injected by Kubernetes and not by the development team as an agent. Uh, so it's a sidecar concept. So it's a very different concept and it gives us better visibility. So if a VM gets compromised and there's an agent there, uh, the bad actor is going to tamper with the logs and the agent is pretty useless pretty quickly. If you compare with a sidecar container because it's alongside the container, not inside the container, you end up having visibility uh, despite the fact that the bad actor got into the container. So that brings a ton of value there. Um, on top of that, we have this uh, adaptability, uh, flexibility of these legal blocks that can be swapped with no downtime and, and having this modern routing of releasing with A-B testing or canary releases. Um, and then of course, uh, we use uh, infrastructure as code and GitOps to automate all that uh, deployment process. And uh, with auto-scanning uh, to uh, a scale based on load, both compute and memory, um, and that's uh, of, of course orchestrated by uh, by Kubernetes automatically. Um, and we talked about the abstraction layer, of course, as well. So when I look at, at the key uh, DevSecOps ingredients, people ask us what's the difference between DevOps and DevSecOps. <clears throat> the SEC is not, you know, just static dynamic analysis. That's the basics of of uh, of uh, DevOps. Um, the key uh, ingredient is GitOps and infrastructure as, co as code. Uh, GitOps it means everything is code, uh, configuration, networking, uh, everything becomes uh, part of the source code. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, the continuous monitoring piece is critical, right? So centralized logging and telemetry, uh, zero trust, behavior detection, all those concepts are foundational and not just uh, basic uh, CV scanning. If you also look at uh, chaos engineering uh, and the concept of moving target defense and uh, emulation and simulation and even train in production to kill things to see how resilient your system can be, that's a critical concept as well. Uh, so of course we recommend people to look at chaos engineering on Kubernetes to uh, to emulate crashes and see how resilient your system can be and you know where uh, you need to focus your time and what to fix based on those uh, tests. Now, when I look at the benefits of IAC, uh, of course, no drift between environments, uh, everything is code. So you have the same environment uh, between classified, disconnected cloud on-premise environments. It's mutable, it's replicable. You can tear it down every night, bring it back every morning. It's automated. Um, no human ideally in production. So that reduced the attack surface, no SSH. People should not connect to production and type commands. They should always go back to um, um, <clears throat> the source code uh, to make a code change and not um, make uh, changes in production. And that obviously reduce inside of threat and configuration drifts and everything, including networking and tests and, and any cyber patch and anything like that becomes um, uh, making a change back in code. So your code becomes your desired state uh, and you can actually look at your code and compare with your runtime, production runtime, and see if there's any delta, you know you have a problem. Either it's a bad actor or someone made a drift to manage to, to connect and make a change that was not allowed. Um, <clears throat> so like we said, GitOps is this concept of Git making, becoming the single source of truth, uh, the desired state of your infrastructure, your platform applications. Uh, everything is in code, even your secrets can be sealed, encrypted in the Git repo. Uh, don't put, put it in clear, of course. Uh, we have full compliance, uh, auditability. Uh, we can do rollbacks if there's a, a bug or an issue. Uh, you can have disaster recovery highly facilitated because all you have to back up is your Git repo and your databases and you have a full backup of everything. You can tear things down and bring it back up uh, with a push of a button. And then of course we like to pull and not push. So a lot of people that do CI CD have their uh, Jenkins or GitLab CI or whatever uh, push into staging or push into production. We don't do that. We pull uh, from Git. So uh, the production cluster or the staging cluster 
pull from specific branches of Git repos, and Git repos are segmented based on the container, uh, based on the service mesh to whitelist access between um, between uh, container A and B, for example. And that is enforcing, you know, need to know least privileged separation of duties uh, by doing these pools, and that removes uh, removes uh, human from uh, production environments. It's a pool, so there's no ports open. Uh, in effect, uh, we don't have to have the CI/CD tools to have access to the to uh, the production system. So no keys. Uh, so if they get compromised, they don't have access to the production system. Um, so we use Argo uh, CD when it comes to platform one right now, and everything becomes uh, a declarative, manifest, and playbooks. Uh, we use Terraform uh, so we don't get locked into a cloud provider. A lot of people um, ask us about um, <clears throat> how to move to microservices and Istio and Service Mesh. Uh, it's very critical to understand that when you move to different programming languages and you have different options, we support 16 programming languages in uh, Platform 1. So obviously, you don't want to have to send libraries or, or coordinate releases like uh, back in the dark days, uh, pre-DevSecOps, uh, and you want to make sure that you can decouple uh, the service mesh from the update of the applications, and the uh, service mesh is going to bring a lot of a lot of capabilities that your team won't have to worry about, uh, whether it's service discovery, API management, authentication, uh, all the uh, modern routing, A/B testing, and gradual rollouts and canary releases and all that fault injection, all the load balancing at layer seven. Uh, the zero trust enforcement, east west traffic uh, whitelisting, and, and, and mutual TLS encryption. Uh, Istio issues a certificate, uh, creates uh, all the, the tunneling, the mutual TLS tunnel. Uh, so, all that is decoupled. So, in effect, <clears throat> your development teams don't have to really worry about that. And it's going to be done regardless whether they uh, thought about it or not. And that is bringing a ton of uh, security and also abstracting. Um, teams so they don't have to coordinate how they authenticate, how they uh, communicate between services, and you have to share libraries and uh, have to update these libraries into uh, the container bits. Uh, in effect, decoupling those from the containers uh, because the the Istio uh, uh, proxy envoy runs as a sidecar container. Um, we have uh, 11 teams working on different uh, DevSecOps initiative as part of the DSOG. I'm the chair of, of the DSOG DevSecOps subgroup. Uh, the team one is working on continuously updating the reference design. The team two is working on Kubernetes, Stigs, and SLGs. Uh, the team three is working on containers, Stigs, and SLGs. Team four is uh, working the cloud native access point reference design. Uh, team five is taking everything we're doing and bring it with NIST, with Ron Ross, uh, as a, a set of uh, special publications. Uh, team six is um, releasing the continuous ATO guidance to take the concept of accrediting the factory and the gates within the factories and the gates of change management, cyber gate, gates, testing gates in terms of code coverage for unit testing, integration testing, end-to-end -end testing, and then continuous monitoring gates as well. Um, and, and and then the, the, the factory that created in the software that passes those gates and come out of the factory are accredited uh, automatically. And then um, we, we authorize the people uh, to use the factory to make sure they have the background uh, checks and clearances and the training uh, specifically for, for the cyber uh, teams, we call them medic in platform one. Um, team seven will take that and turn it into a bunch of training for the SCAs and ASSMs and AOs to understand how to adopt the new CA2 guidance. Uh, team A is demonstrating that we can run Kubernetes and Istio and all that on real time slash embedded systems. It's already done. We have proven we can do that and run Kubernetes on the jets and bombers and so on. So it's already happening, but we are still. Uh, doing deeper dive in terms of certification and how to uh, improve results and uh, uh, really make that kind of the default uh, across uh, across the different systems so we can reuse these Lego blocks and we can be more flexible and more abstracted to the uh, to the to the embedded system. 
Uh, team nine is going to bring a, a DevSecOps playbook with best practices. And uh, team 10 is bringing a DevSecOps uh, concept with high performance computing, HPC. And team 11 is uh, bringing digital engineering as a service. We partnered with uh, uh, OSD, RNE uh, to bring a digital engineering as a service. Um, managed service on platform one to have access on the VDI uh, environment, access to all these tools, uh, so so teams can just uh, have access to uh, uh, modeling and simulation tools without having to build the whole stack.